they are true. <laughs> I'm not your right arm, but maybe I can help something to my limitations, of course. But as I've been helping you from the beginning, you've taught me almost the majority that I know in surgery. So uh, there's nothing that gets as high as that. So thank you to you for that and for inviting me to talk about the individualized solutions on our day clinic. Um, mostly, I started uh, with Rui with a couple of courses of surgery, uh, mostly implants, sinus lift, everything that they did at the time. Uh, posteriorly, um, Rui almost abandoned surgery because I say almost because he can never abandon surgery. <laughs> Other people will not let him, I think. And he started uh, Bone Easy. Um, I was with him already uh, by that time. And so I was a privileged person because I saw from the very first um, implantizes that appeared and I saw the evolution to what we have today. Unfortunately, I don't have cases and then I don't have enough time to show you everything from the time that we started to today, but I will do my best to give you a brief, a brief window about that. Any questions that you have, please feel free to write. Uh, I'm not, I'm not seeing the, what you're writing, but Rui will transfer the writing to me. Okay. Uh, thank you all for listening to me and I hope you enjoy. So first of all, let's give a clear definition of what this is an individualized solution. Basically it gives us a multi-purpose device that is made specifically for a person, for one of our patients. Uh, we have a goal, we have a defined objective, and we go and search for the best way to treat our patient with an individualized solution. It can be bone, it can be a mesh, it can be an implantize. And this is the kit I wanted to show you because this is the bone easy kit. Um, with with these drills, here, okay. With these drills, you do about everything we have in in Bone Easy. You you can start with the bone matrix, bone mesh, implant. This kit is enough for all of them. These are the three types that I been talking about okay on your left side you have a full arch implantize it's an implant that was designed for that maxilla and it won't fit in any other maxilla uh, up on the right we have a piece of bone for you uh, it's hydroxyapatitis and tcp am i right Rui? are you still listening to me no, so, no, I'm listening, but I take out my uh, micro not to get any interference, okay? It's okay. Uh, so this is a TCP and hydroxyapatitis bone block um, that ha it, it makes so much easier to make, for example, an horizontal defect. Uh, it's just like a Lego. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a minute. On your bottom right side, we have uh, what we call a mesh. And these meshes are great for regeneration. I I've done some regenerations with them and I've abandoned a little bit of the bone blocks because these ones are perfect for me. I have a video to show you, okay? And this is part of the process, uh, how Bone Easy makes all the structures that we apply on our patients. On your left, you have the guides for the drills. You have a mesh on your right side. 
See on top of that, the two meshes. And all of this is made by synthetic laser melting. They have this disc and the laser just cuts around to build the, the piece that we want. Okay, let's talk about bone for you. As I said before, they are best suited for horizontal regenerations. Uh, this is majorly because of one thing, is that when we have a lot of thickness on this bone, the vascularization uh, will not be as good as if we have uh, autogenous and heterogeneous bone. The advantages of bone for you, it's a very simple procedure. The, the surgery is very quick. And obviously, when we have fast surgeries, if we do things right, the healing is improved. Uh, the predictability of the graph is also high. This is, I repeat, if you don't want to regenerate great heights or great thickness, okay? But I would say more than five or six millimeters would be too much for this because above that, uh, the vascularization will be lost. Limitations, <laughs> I've talked about this already. Uh, the area of the graft, the type of defect, because for this type of uh, bone for you, you have to have a defect that's expulsive. I mean, you sometimes you have defects that are plain, uh, but other times you have like points and peaks, and that's not a good case to solve with bone for you. Uh, again, the irrigation and vascularization of the big grafts of bone for you are not typically a good thing to for us to do. Obviously, people at Bone Easy, if they see that you are trying to do a bone for you that is too thick or too high, they will be the first to the first ones to tell you that maybe you should change from the bone for you to a mesh for you. Okay, so you always have this control and direct talk with the people that are there. I have this first case to show you. It's the application of uh, bone for you. Okay, it's an anterior upper case that then was solved with implant surgery. But on the upper part, as you can see here, the upper left side, it is a big block. Okay, it's a big block, but we didn't lose anything because the thickness was not more than we could handle. Okay. I hope I'm not passing this too quickly. If so, please tell me. I don't want to take too much of your time either because I know this, if we extend this in time, it can be boring. Let's go and talk about the meshes. And this, this image is of the meshes that Boneasy is making nowadays, okay? It's not how we start. Uh, and this makes it so much easier for me to show you that we started to do this like, uh, five, four or five years ago, really, maybe. And nowadays we have a completely different structure for us to apply. It con consists of an individualized titanium polished frame. And it's basically used to sustain our, our tent. Yeah. We usually fill it with part autogenous and part heterogeneous bone. Uh, normally, we recommend at least 50-50. Uh, I sometimes try to do more, but it depends on the bone available that I have. All of this is always covered with a collagen membrane, okay? At least as far as I'm concerned. Advantages of this, the polished surface that is turned to the tissue part and it won't hurt the tissue. Uh, it allows the implant guide for surgeries, 
for surgeries in one or two steps. And we can have, as you will see later, already a guide for you to make the, the insert of your implants. We can predict the provisional and avoid pressure on top of the graft because we can make the structure uh, as it has um, like a peak on top of it. So we can hold your provisional if needed and it prevents that the provisional is making pressure on your graft. Okay, difficulties of the meshes. Well, the main problem I encountered uh, was not having enough, enough tissue. And I, I'm sure that you have this in all the, the grafts that we do, because normally if, if you have a big defect, uh, the tissues will go after the, the defect. And if you want to grow a lot of bone, obviously you have to have the, the tissue to cover everything, because if you don't, you will lose everything. Uh, mostly the 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 big mistake that i've done in these cases and yes i've done it <laughs> that's why i'm telling about it uh, is the tension of the tissues i always try to not cut much more than i have but uh, sometimes i make it too short and this is the one case that i did it and uh, the back parts of the bone graft just exposed on on this part the distal part uh, that has four or five points more <laughs> it's because i resutured again uh, if you don't release this tension it will swell and it will expose one good thing of these meshes is the the big holes that they have they don't just help you to do the surgery in two ways as we will see further uh, it gives you the the opportunity if you have an exposure it will repitalize beneath the mesh itself it happened to me and i did lose for about uh, two millimeters of the graft but i could do the rehabilitation all the same and the tissues were all right okay so this is what I was talking to you about. Uh, I'm saying this is one year ago. Maybe it was two already. Um, maybe Rui can vouch for that. But I think you can clearly see the difference from in two years from the application of the meshes itself on our patients, the changes that we made. Uh, mostly here, these peaks on the top image uh, are for what I was talking before, for our provisional not to compress my grafts. I wanted them to be higher, but uh, we could not put them higher because of the, the opposing teeth. Uh, on the lower picture, you already have another thing that on the upper we didn't, and it's those little claws and then you can see beside the holes where we drew, um, well, where we put our screws. Uh, and those little claws, they, they are mainly for you to put your membrane. And so sometimes I don't even need to suture over the membrane. I just use these little claws and it's super quick and super steady. This is the first case that I have to show you. Um, this case first came to me as a case to do one implant on the canine, on the 13. And it was supposed to take two crowns, one on the 12th and one on the 14th. As I asked for a CT scan and I realized that as you will see later on, that on the mesial part of the 14 in on the distal part of the 12, there was no bone whatsoever. So I decided to take both teeth out and regenerate the whole area. OK, 
Okay. This is the initial status that I came upon. Okay. And the defect sure looks smaller than what I encountered afterwards. Uh, sorry, Peter. Uh, I see it, this was a case of an implant failure, no? The canine. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It was a patient that came from another clinic, uh, another colleague. I don't know what happened here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here you are starting to see how Bone Easy helps me and you. Uh, this is a video that we all receive during the. Is the video okay? Rui. Sorry, I have to unmute because I sometimes I mute my my phone my microphone uh, is, is the video I mean, yes the video is seeing very well it's playing okay. very well okay. so, no problem. the green the green circles are the the points where we are putting our our screws to hold on the mesh those blue cones are the the pieces that i intended to hold my provisional okay so i could fix the provisional with a cantilever for the centrals and the first molar and the second premolar. This you are seeing now, uh, the red marks are the screws it themselves, okay? And the two circles on top of the design, I wanted them so I can guide the my surgery for putting the implants, okay? This video is always received by the clinician that asks for it, okay? And you have to validate it. Every change that you want to do, you can ask to Bone Easy for them to do it. If you want smaller holes, uh, I wouldn't advise it, but sometimes people just want to make some changes. Normally, uh, my advice is to hear what they have to say, the designers at Bon Easy, because they do this every day and they know certain aspects of this that we are not used to, okay? But if you want to change something, you can always ask for it because this piece will only be synthesized after you give your okay. Continuation of the case i open the flap and as soon as you start doing your incision you're already determining the amount of tissue that you will have to cover your defect uh, i will always try to go larger sideways from the defect because and i i try to maintain the um, the papillas on the tooth that are next to the defect. So I will always try, as you can see here, I did an intracircular, uh, almost supercrestal incision. And when I reach here on the first central, the 11 one, I will go down on this. This photo is not good for that, but I will go down and I will replicate the, the area of the first, the 11, so that when I bring my tissue up, I will cover up that defect, okay? Because I know that all the tissue has to come up. So I try to replicate the area this, that is going to cover on my incision already. This is the defect. So here you can clearly see that there was no bone uh, as in medial of the 14th, and there is no bone on the distal of the 12th, okay? And this is why I had to make this decision. I hope it was the right one, <laughs> to extract both teeth and do the whole regeneration. So this is the defect. And we go back to the question that I was telling you about 
this isn't a good case for a, a bond for you because it has a lot of spikes. You can see it clearly on the right image and you would have to almost cut more bone so you can have an expulsive area that you can apply the, the bone for you, okay? Otherwise, uh, otherwise, another thing is that I think this is much more than five millimeters defect, okay? Here is our mesh. As you can see, I'm using one of the older meshes uh, and still it was great. So I'm really proud of this case. It took a lot of time and work and effort and patience, patience, because uh, it wasn't easy to obtain this. Um, as you can see the mesh, it fits perfectly on the defect as soon as you put it there. Uh, this helps already a lot because you don't have to be holding it just to drill on the holes for your screws. You just leave the mesh there and I can guarantee, at least in this case, it stood right on. Okay. Talk a little about the drills. Okay, we have two drills. Uh, they are color coded as usual. The green drill is the 1.3 and the torque of the screw usually shouldn't be more than 20, okay? The screws are 1.6 diameters. And all of the screws, I think all of the screws for these meshes are the same. Am I right, Rui? Or do you have a larger one for these cases? No, for, for meshes we always use 1.6 uh, screws with yeah. seven millimeters uh, long. Yeah. Okay. Our bone mixture, I uh, use a scraper, bone scraper. Did the mixture and after the mixture, I fill in the gaps. Why are these gaps so fantastically wide? <laughs> because you can do both things. I've seen some colleagues uh, using the mesh. Uh, can, can you see what I'm doing? Rui? No. Okay. I'll do it all the time. I have what you are doing. <laughs> okay. So you can do this. Um, two ways. Uh, I've heard of colleagues that just put the mesh outside and fill it, okay, with all the bone and then they take it to the defect. I don't like to do it that way, but I understand that it's a possible way of doing it, okay. I'd rather fix the, um, the mesh first and then go through these areas and just put a little bit at each time. It takes me longer, but I can uh, be sure that the compression that I have, it's not too much. It's not taking my mesh out of place. And I can guarantee that everything stays there with the collagen membrane afterwards. On this case, I still had to suture, as you can see on the upper right image. I did a periostal suture to hold my membranes because I didn't have the claws. Uh, and due to these complaints and several uh, similar complaints, Rui then designed some claws for making this easier to us. So he hears what we say, which is great. When I'm saying here that sutures of needed, I'm talking, of course, about the sutures to hold the membranes okay not about the final sutures here you can see it again sideways and you can see that if i didn't put these sutures here of course my membrane would not be steady nowadays i don't need sutures i did two cases more i think with these ones and i used the trails membrane it's great for doing this 
and it stayed there perfectly. I didn't lose anything and I didn't suture over the membrane. Here is my final first surgery photo. Okay, as you can see, it's a massive augmentation, at least for me it was. And I didn't have the, all the tissue that I, that I wanted to, to cover it up. Uh, maybe if I would cut a little bit more in the vestibular area, maybe I, I could have released a little bit more of tension. Um, I always use nylon and uh, these PTFE sutures because the PTFE stabilizes the tissues first, okay? And they have this elastic um, memory that it tends to hold the tissues even if the swelling is too too much, okay? So if these are the other sutures, the nylon ones, if they don't hold, at least my PTFE sutures will hold. You can see the OPG of the final, of the first surgery. And here is the reason why I asked those two pins. Uh, through those two pins, I could stable, stabilize my, my provisional, okay? It's cemented. I did a cantilever, as I said before, for the two centrals and the premolar and the first molar. Okay, uh, I think it came out once in eight months. It's good enough for me. The healing, sorry, the healing, it's great. After three weeks only, okay. So this is the re-entry after eight months. Um, I have some colleagues that tend to take the mesh out before uh, they do the rest of the surgery. Um, first, I cut through the mesh itself, and you can do it. It's not that thick. You can do it with a diamond burr. Uh, it's much more easier than I thought at first, I tell you and I cut the upper parts. I did not use the guides for, for the implants, okay? Because I, I had a little bit of bone loss, so I had to uh, preserve my tissue. And that's why I had to cut through the mesh because the, the tissue repetalized between the, this mesh. So I took the mesh first, took the screws out easily, and I then did the implant surgery okay this is the final opg of the second surgery after the implants are placed this is the healing process after that surgery and fixed provisionals, screwed, retained provisionals already to the, my implants. I had another problem here. It's, you, you cannot see it through these pictures, but the, the bite of the patient was really, really deep. So I had to have a, almost a platform so that my teeth of the provisional, they could do the, the arch as I wanted them to do. Implantizes. Well, the implantize is a whole other area. We are leaving our grafts behind and we are using an individualized solution that basically excludes grafts. Uh, this is a um, great alternative, at least for me. I don't do it, the Zygomas implants. Uh, and I think this is a great alternative. Um, the flap and the surgery, um, the flap is similar, but I, I guess, I think the surgery is easier than a zygoma, okay? 
Well, the implant size, as a definition, is and then it has endosseous connections that you can see on the upper image, uh, and the subperiosteal plates where our screws will be placed. Okay, all the screws are like these ones that you're seeing on the bottom right picture. They are treated with a surface like our implants and our clinics nowadays are, okay? So you have the first part of the screw that you can see here on gray, and that is the treat part, the treated part, okay? The other part, it's not treated because it's outside the bone normally, okay? This part will be attached to our implant size. Implantizes can be total or partial. Uh, I have not done many partials, so I don't have many cases to show you. This was a case that Rui landed me, I can say that, so I could show you one piece of uh, a great partial implantize. You would have to regenerate this space, maybe with a career or uh, another kind of regenerative surgery. And this way we avoided the career. We did one surgery and the patient will leave the clinic with a provisional, fixed provisional on the spot on the end of the day, okay? The totals obviously are for totally identical starches. Advantages, and this is one of the major things that I, I think it's mostly being done on every aspect of medicine. It's the reverse planning. Because nowadays we have CAT cam, we have pretty advanced CAT scans, have so much more digital information that we can treat this information in another way. And we can deliver our patients specific tools that will be put on their mouse and we are sure that it is integrated, okay? Yes, the alterations made to the patient's bone are small, as you will see later on. Difficulties, <laughs> and yes, there are difficulties. Uh, everyone who has seen a, a major surgery for zygoma implants knows that the opening of the flap is crucial. So uh, it's the, the best way to maintain your implant size is to have a good opening of the flap and good sutures, okay? Because the suture part is key on this. We have to release the tension and normally <laughs> we don't have that much room for it. Uh, as you can see, as you could see for the, the case of the mesh, it happens to the same extent. Uh, it's, it's really difficult when you have a big defect and you don't have the tissue to go over it. Uh, I've heard and I've talked with some colleagues, uh, Tiago, who's present, and the Merrick, and even Veronica, who does this with me every time. We've talked about making a previous surgery just to make a tissue graft a collagen graft just to bring more keratinized tissue over our implant eyes. We've discussed it, but I have not done it yet. Well, the drill and the insertion of the retention screws in the zygoma area, it's, it's complicated. It's because the access is not good. And as you can see on the bottom pictures, the the guides drills that we have are pretty high so we have a little bit of space up here and you have this big driver and plus a countersink or a handpiece and this does a lot of work to to do this i always recommend uh, to do this this kind of perforation on the zygoma with uh, a straight handpiece. It helps a lot. 
at least at me, it helped me a lot. Another thing, another difficulty that we had and we already don't have, because at Bone Easy they listen to what we say. Uh, we're a big pain in the neck, so to speak, right through it. So uh, we were always completing, complaining about the, the bulky acrylic uh, surgical guides for osteotomy. And as you can see from this picture, they are very thick. And with, as much as you take the tissues out of the way, you will always have some pressure and it's difficult to put the guide in place. So because of these complaints, Rui has come up with another idea. Uh, Rui, do you want to talk about it now? Uh, about the titanium guides. It's much more thinner, means that we can do it with 1.2 millimeters and um, the thickness is really, really, really um, very, very thin, meaning that you don't have to have uh, so bigger flaps because uh, it's much easier. Uh, plus, you can even... Uh, have two in one, meaning you can have you can have on the same uh, on the same uh, guide uh, the preparation for reduction and for the slots. Of course, it is expensive. It's different to print titanium than it is to print resin, as you can imagine. Yes. Uh, so this is the guide, the acrylic guide that comes every time with the implants okay just to refer that and as Rui said the titanium guide it's uh on the side okay so you have to pay extra for it um after i said this i will tell you also that i will always pay that extra okay be sure to do that i would recommend it so now i'm going to show you uh, an implantized workflow so this is what you get when you ask for an implantize an individual solution. This is what you get at your clinic. This is the technical file and you have the position of every screw, okay? And the orientation of every screw on the bottom. Okay? This this those are cuts of the of the CT scan and of the the guide that is made so that you can see how you are going to drill to put your screw okay all the screws are numbered and all of them have specific length and the the white is almost always two millimeters am i right Rui? i'm pretty sure that is in the upper right picture yeah go ahead go ahead Uh, I was saying you are right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So on the box that you get, you have the, the screws, okay? And they are separated. You always have two extra screws, okay? We call them rescue screws. So that if something fails, if you broke some, some screw for excessive torque, and um, I can tell you that I've done it before, so they break. And so you just do, just take it out and do another one. Or, as you'll see later, in some pieces, uh, they can put an extra hole, an extra hole that I only use if I have to rescue one of the other screws. Okay? So I only oh, always use two on the Zigoma area. But uh, at least on, on the last implantizers that came to my hands, they always have three holes, okay? And I consider one of them my rescue hole. This is the video of the surgical guide that we get. See how thick it is? Imagine to put that beneath your palatal tissue and your vestibular tissue. It takes us more time to put uh, this guide correctly, to seat it correctly, than to actually to 
do the osteotomy. The osteotomy, it's crazy easy. The kit also has uh, a specific osteotomy drill. You can see clearly the seating that we are carving for the the arms of the connectors. Okay, and this is the implantized design approval video. And this really helps a lot. And another thing that helps you a lot is the the maxillary guide that Bone Easy sends to you. Uh, you can always see the what you will see after you do the flaps. You can see it before. The blue parts, the darker blue parts are the connectors. Okay. As you can see, the arm that goes beneath it, it's seated on the carving that we've done previously. Nowadays, Bone Easy already gives you these little purple guides to help you to the drilling process. At the beginning, we didn't have them. It was another th another complaint of ours. Uh, and as usual, they, they listen to us and they make it happen. So it's been extremely good to see. Yeah, nowadays we have a pin which you can put on uh, as a guide for see the orientation of the screws. The, ori yeah. the orientation of the Zygoma screws are all on the same, uh, with the same angle. So if you put a pin on, uh, on that uh, guide, you can see right what is the, the direction of the screw and you don't have any risk to fall inside the sinus. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, how long have you had those guides, Rui? It's recent, right? Uh, two months. Two months. But And the first implant ice has how many years? Oh, it was 2016. <laughs> <laughs> so this is so we can we can share the, the evolution of this. And, because I really think that uh, next year I will have a whole different presentation and this will be my old one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I became a little bit lost. Here you can see exactly what I was telling you about, the three holes for three screws. But as you will see, I only used two. This is the first case that I had to show you. Okay. And this case was here in Porto, and they have tried bone regeneration, implants, all the implants was lost were lost. You can still see some pins from the last from the previous regeneration, but everything was lost. Uh, so in alternative, we had two choices, zygoma implants or the implant eyes. The patient actually know zygoma surgery. He knew zygoma surgery from a friend or a relative, and he was sure he didn't want to have it. So this was a big point for me for, to, for the proposition of doing an implant eyes. Um, Is the video running? Yes, it is. Okay. Here you can see the flap that we did. I try to always, before doing my, my first incision, to take the implant out and then seat it on the model that, we, that you have. And after that, I can take it off the model put it in the mouth and you can see exactly 
where your connectors will be. And that helps you to prepare your incision because I can throw the incision away from the branches and uh, the platforms where the connectors are because those are the, the places where we sometimes have exposures of the, of the, of the implant eyes. So I always try to prepare and over prepare. So after all the preparation that we do, I still get the implant and I put it almost in the mouth so I can see exactly where I can take my tissue to. Okay. You see here the at the at first I didn't do this this discharge, the, the front discharge. Uh, and I realized from seeing other colleagues surgeries that it was much better for releasing the tissue in the back. It gives me a lot, a lot of more tissue. I didn't do it at first because on the first that I did, I had an exposure on this place. And so I thought that maybe I could gain or benefit from not doing the that incision. Um, I was so wrong. It was not because of, of the incision. Uh, I don't know why it opened like that, but I've done several cases after, always with this incision, and it's way better. You can clearly see the zygoma completely in front of you on the right side picture. I did not take this implant out because it's not doing any harm and it wouldn't stress our implant because we made it so that it wouldn't touch it even. On this upper picture, you have the full exposure. You can also see the defects on the, the wall of the sinus on the first quadrant. Let me take you back here just for a second. Here you are. You can see, I knew it was there before I went to the surgery, okay? This I consider very important. Sorry about that. So here you have the incision. I always do the anterior incision near to the nasal spine and the two posterior incisions I always predict them to be further from the from my last connector, okay? So that my incision is not on top of that arm that goes up to your zygoma. I sometimes we cannot do it because the tissue guides our surgery always, okay? But this case was okay. Okay. Here you can see the seating of the implant eyes. It's completely attached almost to the bone. Okay. Sometimes, uh, if you can look at your upper right picture, you can see a little of the membrane below the connector, uh, the sinus membrane. That happens because sometimes when you do the osteotomy, and I'd rather do this and leave an open space than have the implant eyes on top of the bone. I realized on the first surgeries that I did that when we didn't do the osteotomy, it, it was much more difficult to design the, the implant eyes and the, the attachment that we had from the implant size to the bone was not as perfect as this one. So I'd rather cut through the bone and sometimes exposure the sinus. Uh, and I tell you, I never did regeneration on these cases. And so far I do not have any problem with this. Okay. It just happened to me two times and it's all good. Okay, tips for this surgery. We are always trying not to go much more than we have to. And sometimes I take too many time, too, 
too many minutes just to raise the flap at the level that I can put my drivers here. Because you don't have just to open the tissue up to the point that the implant ice goes. You have to remember that then you will have to separate the tissue and get enough space so you can have the, the drivers to do the drilling and to do the screw positioning, okay? Uh, I always, every, almost every, every case that I did, I always expose the external border of the zygoma, uh, the ascending curve, and once we encounter the infraorbitary hole. Okay, you have to have pretty attention to this. This is the end of our surgery. Brilliantly sutured for our, by I call our colleague Veronica Diniz. She's my my right hand on these surgeries, and you have on your left side the provisional at the end of the day. Okay. This is the post-op OPG, and you can clearly see at the OPG, we have three screws on one side and two on the other one. And this happened because the zygoma sometimes is really, really uh, dense bone. This was the case. Um, I broke one drill and one screw. <laughs> the, the middle screw here, I think it's the middle one. The middle screw here, it doesn't have the, the head parts because it broke when I was uh, inserting it. What happened was that I did the drilling with the 1.3 and the 1.6 drills, but the bone was so thick that I had like this much of the screw outside of the bone and outside of the implant eyes. So I had to decide, uh, do I force the screw or do I take it out? One of those, uh, I had to do it. Um, I wrongly decided to go for it and the screw broke uh, its head, but it, it stabilized my implant. So it helped me on some part and I ended up using the rescue screw to put above it. I did not take that one because it was completely fixed at more torque than we usually have. The torque of the screws is normally around 15, 20. I've, I have some screws that I did at 30 and 35, but normally we go for 20 Newtons, okay? This is the picture of eight days post-op. See how it's always more difficult on the back parts where the the extension goes to the zygoma. Here it was especially difficult because we had really harsh conditions of tissue. The the tissue, the keratinized tissue was not uh, so good. Uh, in the vestibular area, uh, maybe we will do a graph there. We haven't seen the opening yet, but I'm counting on it. So maybe I will have to do something there. Other cases of full arch implant eyes. This is the pre-op. I wanted to do a lower LN4, but the patient did not want to do it because he thought all his attention should go to the upper parts. Why? Because he tried to solve the problem many times and he didn't have a solution till now. This is the end of this case, okay? And this is not provisional. This is, is already a, a definitive prosthetics. And he was clearly satisfied with the results. And so was I. Another case, another case that has been needs surgery 
too many times. And this is how we solved it. Uh, actually, the lower part is from a dear friend of mine called Americ Sampai. He, I know he's there. And my friend, perfect all on four, thank you for giving me, me this perfect OPG photo. Uh, another case, and this was done a few months back. As you can see here, I only have the two screws on the Zygoma, okay? And this is what I usually do. I always rather have one rescue than none, okay? <clears throat> okay, I think this was the first case that we did, Rui. Okay. Okay. Uh, when our Romanian friends did the favor to take some pictures. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the one picture that I have because Rui was uh, working on this case with me. So another person was taking our pictures. Uh, this is the only one I have, but this implant is one of the oldest that I've done. And even so, at that time, the the approximation, the the seating of the of the piece to the bone was perfect. But a a must that uh, I recommend to everyone. But I think now nowadays Bonizia is designing all of them like this. Am I right, Rui? Because yeah. this seating on the posterior part. It makes makes ev every difference, every difference. This is the healing after eight days. Okay. And this, this one also went with a fixed prosthetic on the end of the day. All of these cases were. I hope you enjoyed it. I I hope you have taken something positive out of this. Thank you, Rui, again for inviting me and for teaching me and for bringing me into the individualized solutions in, in surgery. Uh, I hope you all have taken something good out of this little bit. And if you can, after this whole COVID thing leaves us alone, just visit Porto because it's not my hometown, but it has become my hometown. It's a fantastic place. So please visit us. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot to tell in the beginning that Pedro is not only a great surgeon, but is one heck of a photographer. Uh, and um, you want to be, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and I uh, really admire a lot his, his photos he has photos from several points in the world and um for people who know him uh, <laughs> the biggest part of his luggage it's the the photo <laughs> the, yeah. the photo equipment <laughs> as you know okay uh thank you everyone is very happy with presentation i don't see i just see one question what is the option when the patient doesn't has a little bit of keratinized gum around future implant or placing implant of okay. implant uh, you, are you can you see uh, i don't see but i heard what you say um for me it's what i have discussed with actually some people that are here present uh some colleagues of mine here from porto that sometimes uh, maybe we should try and do uh, a collagen graft before we actually do the, the implant size. If you don't have keratinized tissue, it will for sure expose. It hasn't been a problem for me uh, just yet, but because uh, the exposures that I had are very little and in places that really 
uh, easy for us to, to manage. Uh, normally, they are on the upper part inside our vestibulum because the, the tissue is very thin and you have uh, all the muscles and uh, all the, the function of, of the, the cheek. It's always pulling them around that little curve that you have on the posterior part. So that, that tissue sometimes opens. But what happens next is when it opens, you have, okay, we have the, the metal part, the titanium part. The tissue exposes here, okay, and it repetalizes just beneath. So you won't have a, an open exposure for bacteria to go in. Uh, as much for I can see, I regularly uh, control them and they are not expanding. They just reattach beneath it and they are okay. Even so, I am considering that hypothesis that I told you. I've spoke with Tiago Costa. I know he's there uh, a lot about this. And he also told me that the his idea is to start to do the the first surgery before the implant eyes to do a graft just to give some keratinized tissue to the posterior parts mainly okay i have another um i have another question from joanna Freire. uh in relation to mesh she is asking about the pins if the pins are not a danger for exposure and like uh, Sucking um, no. film inside. No. The, the... For the cases that I have, I have no exposure on the vestibular or palatal parts of the of the mesh. Uh, the exposure that I had was on top of the mesh, and as I said before, uh, it was I consider it it was my mistake. If I would done it now, I would do it differently because I I would not leave the the tissues so with so much tension. I, I think I, I'd had to go and spend a little more time just pulling it much more so it can seat and not pull when it swells. Okay, another question from Juan Jose Hernandez uh, about the incision design. I imagine that he's uh, talking about uh, total frameworks and uh, if the incision depends on the output of the implants connection, uh, I think you already told this I, that you yeah, always I do tend, the same approach, you know? I, I tend to make it depend on it because um, normally if you do an approach for a zygoma implant, you don't know where the head of the zygoma will be, right? So you always do a palatal approach. Uh, I started doing these surgeries the same exact way in the palatal approach, uh, but I discovered uh, from at least two cases that I did, that if I did a supracrestal approach, uh, if I have the, um, the palatal tissue uh, on the outer side of the connector, it's perfect. It's the best thing that can happen in, in those surgeries because um, I will not need for a cover-up from a graft, a tissue graft on those. I'm sure of it. Uh, there, were, there is uh, also a question from Ahmed Kamal uh, about uh, if there is or no uh, osteointegration uh, says uh, which is one of our person, yeah, one of our user of these meshes. He already said, uh, no, because today it's polished. Maybe in the deeper parts it can grow a little bit of bone, but uh, really not a problem to take it out. I think. Don't you agree? No. You do. We have the osseointegration integration in the screws, the mini screws uh, or mini implants. them right. It, I, I heard the question the other day by Bernardo and. I agree with him. Are they mini implants? Mini implant screws? <laughs> You've got to come up with a name for them. Yeah. Okay, everyone, I think we are finished with the questions. And uh, again, uh, thank you, Pedro. Um, thank it's you. really amazing to have you here. Uh, it's, 
It's the first time that I really have, uh, have the the, um, the pleasure to present to you to lecture, okay? And yeah. uh, I hope I can do this more times. Uh, it's thanks to it's you. It's really you great. To thank me, I need to thank you. Because if, we're, okay. if it were you, I wouldn't even have done it. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. And see you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye.